Hello, we are Memphis Community University. Today we are going to be talking about Taylor series for, uh, free response questions. So if you don't know our channel, basically what we do is we take every single free response question on the AP exam and we create 11 videos for it. The first video is an overview video. This is the overview video of Taylor series. And then we create 10 practice videos where we go from difficulty one through difficulty 10 so that you can master each free response question topic and you can practice alongside with us. So in this case, we're gonna be doing uh, Taylor series free response questions. Of course, Taylor series free response questions are some of the hardest questions. They're BC only, of course, and they are really what makes the BC exam BC. So what I do is, because these questions are so hard, um, it is good to watch this video and watch these difficulty videos. Um, we've sort of sorted them, actually. There's sort of variations of Taylor series free response questions. Uh, the first one is, and we'll talk about all of this, of course, uh, but the first one is using the Taylor series formula uh, at some point with the derivatives. So that's our first. So if you want to watch videos on that, that'll be difficulty one, four, and seven, I believe have, have those questions. Then there's questions that are special function questions, which involve a function like e to the x or sine of x or cosine of x, where you're taking one Taylor series and going to another, taking derivatives of Taylor series, integrals of Taylor series. Uh, those free response questions we categorize uh, as a different type way, and that's going to be difficulty two, five, and eight. And then finally, there's some Taylor series questions where the main majority of the question is uh, finding the interval of convergence by setting up the ratio test. We'll practice this as well in this video. Those videos are difficulty three, six, and nine. And then we finally have just random, uh, random question for difficulty 10. But again, this is how you do Taylor series. I listed out all the skills actually before we are going to get started because, um, because they're so confusing that it's nice to know sort of what uh, is going to be asked of you. Uh, one other thing is that I actually wrote out all the work already as opposed to writing this out because if I didn't, this video would be quite long. Uh, this video, I'm assuming, will be quite long, uh, but you don't want to really watch a two-hour video on videos, uh, Taylor series. I mean, maybe you do, but I don't know you, but let's just try to keep it as short as possible, but still be thorough. So again, these are the main skills. Um, we talked about how there's sometimes you have to find the radius or the interval of convergence, and to find the radius of convergence, use the ratio test. Again, those are our difficulty three, six, and nine videos. Then we are going to be doing the skill a lot where we're taking a Taylor series formula and creating it from scratch using derivatives. That's usually a given. That's our difficulty uh, one, four, and seven videos if you're checking out this playlist. Then, we, as we talked about, there's going to be special function Taylor series that you have to memorize. E to the x, sine of x, cosine of x, ln, uh, and geometric series is generally the, the way to go. And that's going to be our difficulty two, uh, five and eight videos as they get harder. And then there's some random questions here and there that you do want to know. Uh, plug in, multiply, and subtracting Taylor series. That's different than uh, the Taylor series formula. That's going from one Taylor series to the next by either plugging in or multiplying by some expression of X. You will see that. Then we have a pretty easy skill actually, differentiation and integration of Taylor series. This is always the power rule. Um, so I'm not going to be writing too much because I've written out so much already. Uh, as you'll see, but I'm going to use this pen at least to point to things. And then uh, sometimes they ask you to have a, a Taylor series and write it as a rational function. That's going to be geometric series where you use a over one minus r. And again, we're going to be talking about this for the next uh, 40 minutes to an hour, probably. Uh, another thing they like to ask is forcing you to determine whether a relative min or maximum, uh, whether the function has a relative or min or maximum based off the Taylor series. And the way they force you to do that is that's going to be the second derivative test as opposed to the, uh, the normal uh, first derivative test where f has a rel max when f prime goes from positive to negative, f has a rel min when f prime goes from negative to positive. Instead, we're going to do the second derivative test. And then finally, they like to ask error bound questions, of course, and Lagrange uh, bound questions, uh, Lagrange error, uh, basically showing that some approximation is uh, fairly close to some function value. So again, these are the main skills. Perhaps uh, uh, we have high technology in our video, so I hopefully will be able to uh, sh sort of flash you these skills every once in a while. Um, so we're going to go in order. We're going to start off with radius and interval of convergence, and then we'll move on. So this is my radius and interval of convergence page. Um, so the first thing to do on a radius and interval of convergence is first make sure you have the general term. You don't want to do the interval of convergence and the radius of convergence process on the derivatives. You need the general term, you need x's in the question. So for example, in the future, uh, we're going to have something like, um, let's see, we're going to have a, 
uh, derivative formula. And you can't do the interval convergence on this derivative formula. You need to find the general term first. So here we're already starting off with the general term. Notice we have x's. So that's the key. Again, I'll highlight this when we get to that general term stuff. But when you have the general term, what to do is you first need to find the radius convergence. And how do you find the radius convergence? You have to set up the ratio test. And it's always the ratio test. This is the ratio test. Um, this is just a series question, but if you have a sum of a series, what you do is you set up the ratio of the one term and the next term, so a n and a n plus one, and we're trying to find the radius and interval of convergence. So basically, we're trying to find the x's so that this series converges. And what does the ratio test says? The ratio test says that this series will converge. All right, converge if this limit is less than one. So basically, what you do is you always apply the ratio test. And then whatever you get from the ratio test, you just see uh, what x's make that less than one. And we'll practice that. So the first thing we do is uh, you're going to do radius convergence first. And then if necessary, you're going to do interval of convergence. So in this case, the radius is actually infinity. Interval is all row numbers. So uh, sort of uh, spoiling the fun. But so again, it's radius convergence with the ratio test. And then what you do is you get usually two endpoints and then uh, you plug in the endpoints into the general term and then you're going to determine whether that converges. That's the interval of convergence part. But again, we'll practice this uh, throughout this video. Keep in mind, again, you do need it on the general term. You need to have the x's. Uh, you can't do it on the derivative formula or just the coefficients. So in this case, what you do is to set up the ratio test, again, for the radius of convergence, what you do is you plug in n plus 1 into this because we were trying to find a of n plus 1. Keep in mind that this is not bumping up everything by 1. You're actually plugging in n plus 1. So in this case, uh, for example, you get n plus 1, you get n plus 1 minus 1, and you'll get n plus 1 plus 1, which is n plus 2. But just So all these did get bumped up, but keep in mind that, for example, when we plug in n plus 1 here, uh, we'll get this right here, 2 times n plus 1 plus 1, 2 n plus 2 n plus Sorry, I can't pronounce this. 2n plus 2 plus 1. So you're going to get 2n plus 3. So notice this is bumped up by 2. And that's because we're actually plugging in n plus 1. We're not bumping up every single exponent and factorial by n plus 1. The easier thing is, again, you're setting up this ratio. So you're always dividing by the an. But I never actually divide by the an. I actually multiply by the reciprocal. That's the same thing, of course, by divide, uh, of division. So what I do is I just take this guy and I flip it, as you can see here. So before we start crossing out a lot of these things, I did write some sort of uh, general rules of how to cross things out. So, so sometimes you have stuff to the n, whether that be x to the n or a number to the n. So that's just exponent laws. For example, 10 to the 9th over 10 to the 8th, that's 10. Uh, that's a standardized test question a lot. a to the b over a to the c is equal to a to the b minus c. Division is equal to subtraction. Or you can just think of this as 10. Uh, nine tens, eight tens, and then you cross a lot of them out, and you'll be left with 10. So same thing here, even if you have an exponent like n, and x to the n plus 1 over x to the n, well, there's one more x in there, so when they cancel out, it will be x. So this is a nice way to um, practice in canceling out as, as we do radius and interval convergence. Then uh, you might have stuff where it's not x to a n or 3 to the n or a number to the n, but you have n to a number instead. And when you're... Uh, remember that you're always taking the limit when you're setting up the ratio test. So this limit, what we call this limit as same heavy. Basically, uh, what you do is because these same because these uh, polynomials have the same leading exponent squared in this case uh, into the one in this case. When you do the limit, everything else that's not the leading exponent uh, pales in comparison in terms of the magnitude of the leading exponent. So always these are going to be same heavy meaning that the limit will be the ratio of the leading exponents. So you're just going to get a number like 1 or something. Uh, so the leading exponent is 1, 1, 1, 1. So those are usually canceling out very nicely uh, when we do our limits. They are usually not included in the limit once we simplify everything. Finally, the most confusing thing perhaps is factorials. Uh, so I just practiced this factorial. Remember, 10 factorial is the same thing as 10 times 9 times 8 times 7 all the way down. 9 factorial is 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 all the way down. So when you have 10, all of that canceled out, just keep in mind that 10 factorial is the same thing as 10 times 9 factorial. So 9 factorials will cancel, so you're just left with 10. So for example, if you're doing n plus 2 factorial, n plus 2 factorial is the same thing as n plus 2 times n plus 1 times n factorial all the way down. So the n factorials will cancel, you're left with this. 
So when you're doing factorial, just look at how much bigger or smaller is the top. So for example, on the off the top of my head, 98 factorial over 100 factorial. Well, the bottom will be two bigger than that, 99 and 100. So those will cancel out as 1 over 99 times 98. And it works the same way when you have ends. So let's practice. Um, so now, again, this is the setup. What you do is you plug in n plus 1, and then you multiply by the reciprocal of just the original. And then you start canceling stuff. So we're going to use these rules that we uh, talked about earlier. So the first thing to cancel that's very easy is anytime you have negative 1, you don't even need to cancel out the exponents because you're doing absolute value. So uh, the negative ones will automatically go away. Then we talked about this, the exponents, x to the n over x to the n minus one, that's just gonna be x, because there's one bigger one than, n is one bigger than n minus one, so you have one more x in the numerator. And then uh, I like to cancel out the n's very nicely. This is the same heavy stuff that we were talking about earlier. The limit as n goes to infinity of n plus two and n plus one uh, is one, because the leading exponents are the same. So these will just cancel out. This limit will just be one. Finally, uh, factorials, how much bigger is this one than this one? Well, it's going to be uh, 2n plus 3 and 2n plus 2, because the next one is 2n plus 1, so those will all cancel. So this is what we're left with, um, as, as shown. Uh, we do have the absolute value of x, and then we have this on the bottom. Great. Um, so again, just practice simplifying things. Uh, this video series is just as an overview. It's just to provide you with a quick example or of each of these concepts, but if you want uh, more examples, of course, you can watch our videos as we go from difficulty 1 through 10. And just practice with exponents, practice with factorials, and practice with same heavy limits. So once you have this guy right here, if you still have, if you don't have n's, that's great. When you take the limit as n goes to infinity, keep in mind that x is di way different than n, so uh, it's not x to infinity, it's n to infinity. So when you don't have any n's, usually you're just left with some pretty simple thing, as we'll see in the next one. But when you do have n's, you still have to take the limit. So notice when you take the limit, the bottom is going to go to infinity because it'll be infinity times infinity. Any number divided by infinity, no matter how big it is, will still will eventually be equal to zero or it'll approach zero as you take the limit. So remember that again, when you do the ratio test, you always uh, compare whatever ratio you get to be less than one because those are going to be the x's that converge because the ratio test says uh, the limit of this absolute value thing less than one, those are the things that make it converge. So in this case, uh, no matter what the x is, you get zero, which is less than one. So here the ra radius is actually uh, infinity, and the interval of convergence is all row numbers. Uh, remember there's three cases. Either the radius will be a finite number, either the radius will be zero, meaning that the uh, interval of convergence is just the center point. In this case, the center point was zero, because there's no like x minus a. And then the more common case is going to be the second one. Uh, the, sorry, the third, um, the where the radius is a finite number and you, you you plug in the endpoints for the interval. But again, this is how you do the ratio tests. I don't think it's too bad. Um, when it's on the AP exam, usually it's worth five points where you're doing the radius of convergence for around three points and then you do interval of convergence for the last two. Um, but it's not too bad because if you just practice enough um, and you just start crossing out things and you get used to it, before we go to this interval of convergence question, I would just like to remind you that we have videos on all these concepts that we're about to talk about. We have five Taylor series videos, maybe pairs of videos where um, you can find one made by me, you can find one uh, made by my former students. Uh, we have ones on rate, interval of convergence of power series, Taylor series, introduction, that includes the formula, special function uh, Taylor series, differentiation and integration Taylor series, and then uh, miscellaneous Taylor series topics like Lagrange. So just check those out if you need practice. We made all these videos for you guys to practice. Um, but in this case, ratio test is not too bad. This gave me radius and convergence. So let's practice interval of convergence. We might as well. Again, this video might be quite long. So I have this guy. Remember that you can only do it on the uh, general term. This is the general term because you do have the x's. It's not just a derivative or it's not just the coefficient of the Taylor series or power series. So again, what I do is I um, plug in n plus 1, which is what I did, and then I multiply by the reciprocal because I'm setting up the ratio test. Here, uh, notice that when you cancel these out, you'll be left with negative 2, but really you can write this as 2 because you take absolute value. That's where this 2 came from. Same thing with these x minus 1s. It's 1 bigger, so it's going to be x minus 1. Uh, keep in mind that in this case, the center point is, S is 1 because always it's x minus a. 
Then you have these guys, but these guys are pretty nice because this is the sort of the same thing, uh, the leading coefficient uh, as n goes to infinity. The plus one really doesn't matter, so these ratios are going to be one as you take the limit as n goes to infinity. So remember that you're always trying to isolate, uh, for example, x minus c is less than r. So you're always going to say, whatever you get in the limit, you're going to compare that to be less than one, and then you want to isolate x minus c. So for example, in this case, the c is 1 because that's the center point. So you definitely do not want to distribute this 2. I, I, I write that it's less than 1 because that's how the ratio test works. You want to find the x's that are less than 1. But I definitely don't want to distribute this 2. I want to bring it to the other side because this that's how it works. I need to isolate x minus c in the absolute value. In this case, it is the absolute value of x minus 1. So this is r. This is the radius. Um, again, this would just setting up the ratio test, doing the limit, computing it, and finding the radius. This is actually worth three points, and notice this is not that much work if you get used to it. So then what you do is you take your center point, so I'm going to call that one, and then you take whatever your radius is, and you add that radius, and you subtract that radius. So in this case, uh, to find the potential endpoints. So when you have one here, you're going to add a radius, so that's going to be three halves. Uh, one plus one half is three halves. And then same thing with the other side, it's going to be 1 minus 1 half. So there's, you add an r and you subtract an r. So it looks like it's going to be 1 halves and 3 halves. So we can actually start writing our interval of convergence. We can write it as 1 half comma 3 halves. And remember what happens is you plug in uh, both of these terms individually, they don't have anything to do with each other, into the general term, because x is are these two numbers. And you see using a series test, whether it converges or diverges, at these endpoints because the ratio test is inconclusive on the endpoints. Uh, notice when you plug in one half here, uh, for example, you're just going to get one and you need it to be either less than one to converge or greater than one to diverge. So it's inconclusive. So you have to test it with another test basically. So again, all you do is you plug in one half into three half in this as we're about to do. Uh, remember that if it converges, that means it's a bracket because you want that in your convergence. So you want it to be close. And then this, if it's uh diverges, then you want it to be a parenthesis. You don't want to include that in your interval of convergence. So uh, basically what you do, again, is you plug in one half, you plug in three halves. They don't have to do any with each other, so you can do either one. It's actually easier usually to plug in the right side because there's less negatives. So I'm going to talk about that one first. Um, so I'm plugging in three halves. When you plug in three halves, um, you get three halves minus one. That's two to the, um, sorry, one half to the n plus one. That's the same thing as one over two n plus one. And then one thing is that the thing that is the most tricky when you're plugging in these endpoints is definitely the negatives because the negatives affect it so greatly because it could be an alternating series test if it if the negative is alternating or it could be just a P series, which would affect the convergence and divergence if the negative is just always negative on every term or always positive on every term. So one thing is I use the rule um, a, times, a to the B times A to the C is equal to A to the B plus C. That's an exponent rule to split up negative two to the N as negative 1 to the n times 2 to the n. So that's, again, negative 2 is negative 1 times 2, and we can split that up so that the exponents on both. That way, it will allow me to simplify things. So for example, in this case, the 2 to the n divided by 2 to the n plus 1, that will just be a 2 on the bottom. That won't affect the series because it's not getting raised to an n. So then you're left with only negative 1 to the n, and negative 1 to the n over square root of n, well, that converges by AST uh, because what it says is, you take the things that are positive, 1 over 2 root n, and it's decreasing and going to 0. Same thing for 1 over n squared, 1 over n, um, 1 over n being the alternating harmonic series. When you have the alternating part, because the positive terms are decreasing and going to 0, this thing converges by AST. So for example, what we know is that if this one converges by AST, or converges at all, at this 3 halves number, we'll know that the answer has a bracket on this side. So now we're going to plug in one half and plugging in one half, the left point is usually harder because it introduces negatives. And again, I think negatives are hard. So notice what I'm doing here. I did the same sort of step here. I split up the negative two to the end to negative one to the end times two to the end because it'll be easier to simplify. Um, same thing with this. I split up this negative one to the n plus one as negative one to the n plus one times one over two n plus one again, because it's easier to simplify. I crossed out the 2 to the n over 1 of the 2 plus n, so that's just 2. And then I combine these using this rule again. Negative 1 times n to the negative 1 times n plus 1. 
uh, I'm going to, I would have the same base. My base is always negative one. So I want to raise it. Uh, I just want a single negative one and I want to find the new exponent. The rule is you add the exponents when you're multiplying by the same base. For example, um, two to the fourth times two to the sixth is not two to the 24th, it's two to the 10th. So in this case, it's negative one to the n plus n plus one. That's two to the n plus one. And whenever you have these negative ones, what you want to think about is whether it, that negative one is alternating or whether that negative one is always negative one or whether that negative one is even actually when you raise it to an even power, meaning it's one. So just keep in mind, just plug in some numbers and just test it out. Notice that when we plug in one, you'll get three. When you plug in two, you'll get five. So you're actually getting every odd integer. So negative one to an odd integer is just negative one. This one was alternating. Uh, it alternates between negative one and one. For example, if this plus one wasn't here, it'd be negative one to the two n, so that'd be negative one to an even integer every single time. So that would convert uh, be one, because it's negative one to an even integer. Um, so that's just one. So in this case, uh, because this is negative one to the two n plus one, as we said, it's always negative one, and negatives don't really affect anything because there's no raising to the end, so it's just a constant in the front. You could actually take out negative one half if you want. Uh, but this is a divergent series. This is a p series where p is equal to one half, which is less than one. Uh, so this diverges. If, for example, it was n squared, it would converge. Uh, if it were n, it would still diverge. That's the harmonic series. So in this case, what we're going to do is our final answer is going to be a parenthesis then. And that's how you do interval convergence. What you do is you find the ratio test first. You, uh, you add one. You plug in n plus one into everything. Then you multiply by the reciprocal of the original, cross out stuff according to this these sort of rules, exponents, limits, and factorials. Uh, eventually, what you want to do is you'll get something like this. You always compare it to be less than one because that's where uh, the x's will converge. You try to isolate this guy. So for example, in this case, I had to bring over the one half. This is the center point. So I like to draw a little number line. I don't think most people do it, but I like to draw this little number line because uh, it's, it's nice. Uh, you put the center point right here, and then you add the radius, subtract the radius. Those are going to be your endpoints. Plug in the endpoints individually. Be very careful with negative 1. And then when you do the convergence test, it will probably be something pretty simple, actually. Uh, alternating series test, geometric divergence test, where uh, you don't even have any fractions, so it diverges automatically. Or um, alternating harmonic series, or alternating P series, if I haven't mentioned that. So again, uh, this is how you do radius and interval convergence. It did take a, about 20 minutes to talk about it, but it is a pretty important concept. Again, if you want to watch our difficulty uh, 3, 6, and 9 videos, I would watch those as we practice more interval convergence questions. So now let's actually talk about Taylor series. Uh, so here's the Taylor series formula, of course. Um, so just keep in mind that these are the terms. This is the general term. This is the general term uh, for McLaurin series, where the center point is 0, of course. So when you have these Taylor series, for every single term, what I tell my students is just be aware uh, that three things always match. So for example, if you take this guy right here, it's always three things matching. The number of the derivative, the factorial, and the exponent. So it's 3, 3, 3, 2, 2, 2. The next one would be the fourth derivative at a over 4 factorial x minus a to the fourth. And I'm going to be referring to the derivative a lot because notice there's so many derivatives in these formulas. But keep in mind that it's not the derivative actually, it's the derivative at a point. So always these simplify. So keep in mind, what's the coefficient in a Taylor series? Well, it's the derivative of that, whatever number derivative you have, like the second deriv derivative, over the, uh, the corresponding factorial number. And you plug in the uh, center point. So this is what the coefficient is. This is going to be the terms. So again, just be wary of that. Um, three things matching always. Derivative number, factorial, and exponent. Same thing with the McLaurin series. For example, 2, 2, 2 where the center point is uh, 0, so that's why it's not x minus some number, because it's x minus 0 uh, to the squared. So that's how you do McLaurin series. This is just the formula, and we're going to be using this quite often. So before I start, what I want you to, what I want to preface is there's two main Taylor series questions. The first Taylor series question will be using this formula. You're given something about the derivative, or you're given derivative formulas, uh, or der derivative values. And from scratch, using this formula right here, you form a Taylor series, as we're about to do. The other main Taylor series question is you do not want to do this process because it will be very, very annoying uh, if they go from uh, to take a lot of derivatives. The other process is going from one Taylor series to the next. 
So for example, that might be starting off with a Taylor series of EDVX and going to another Taylor series related to the EDVX, which we'll do in the future. Um, sorry, that wasn't the right page. Again, this is going to be a very long video, but uh, this sort of stuff. Then uh, another way is, for example, if you're taking a derivative of a Taylor series, you definitely don't want to use the formula. You want to just go take the derivative of that Taylor series using power rule. Same thing with integrals. So again, the main thing I would uh, want to know is uh, which two strategies am I doing to form a Taylor series? Is it from scratch? Is there no other Taylor series present? So I need to use the formula because I have some sort of information about the der derivatives. Or do I already have a Taylor series I know either by memorization or by given, and should I go from one Taylor series to the next without ne uh, while neglecting the formula because it'd be so awful to use. Uh, for example, like taking fourth derivatives, that'd be awful. But for now, we are going to be using the Taylor series formula. Again, these are the free response questions that are of the level uh, difficulty one, four, and seven. So the first question, uh, I actually wrote out a Taylor series. Uh, one thing to mention is what what is it what is the difference between fourth degree Taylor polynomial versus first four non-zero. So first four non-zero terms is literally the first four non-zero terms. So for example, it'd be one, two, three, four. Um, what is the Taylor uh, degree Taylor polynomial? Again, it's not the exact same thing as the four non-zeros. The degree polynomial just means the leading and the biggest exponent is just going to be this number right here. So it's to the fourth. And then you just include every term before it. So if there were an x squared term, it would still be five terms actually for the fourth degree Taylor polynomial. Because again, you just uh, go all the way up until you hit x to the fourth, but also include everything else. It's still a polynomial, so it's not just the, the x to the fourth term. So be careful with that. So this is a pretty easy question. Uh, we're trying to find the third derivative at two. This might be more of a multiple choice level question. But remember, uh, this is the polynomial. This is the Taylor series formula. Hopefully you can see that. So where does the third derivative lie in any single Taylor series question? Well, the third derivative, while it's not exactly the coefficient of the x cubed term, it's part of the coefficient of the x cubed term. Again, every single term, there's three things matching, the derivative number, um, the factorial, and the cube. So if I'm looking for a specific derivative number, I look at the term that has the same exponent and factor, uh, same exponent. The factorial I don't want to look at because it might be simplified a little bit. So again, this entire Taylor polynomial, none of this matters except this term right here. Uh, keep it, because it's the one with the cube. And again, the cube has the third derivative. So when you're looking at this, remember to be a negative. So what's the coefficient of um, any Taylor polynomial over x cube, uh, the cube term? It's the third derivative divided by 3 factorial. So I set that to be negative 2 fifths, and I solved uh, 3 factorial being 6, because it's 3 times 2 times 1. So it's 6 times 2, which is 12, and then you simplify. So again, uh, that's how you go from a Taylor series to a derivative. You look for the right term, and then you write out the coefficient. Keep in mind the coefficient is not the derivative. The coefficient is actually the derivative over factorial, so the derivative over factorial. But we're able to solve it. So that's how you go from uh, Taylor series to a polynomial. Not as likely as a question. When it is asked on the free response questions, usually it's only worth one or two points. What's very asked often is um, they give you a derivative formula, and then they ask you to find the first four terms and the general term. Before we start off, uh, just keep in mind that if, if this was the first question and the second question was, uh, for example, find the interval of convergence, you cannot do, or even the first question actually, you cannot do the process that we described earlier uh, using the ratio test, again, on this derivative formula. That's what my students get so tr uh, trouble with, and they get really stuck because they don't understand what the ratio test is giving them because they don't have the x's. So you cannot do the interval conversions on a derivative formula or even the coefficients. You have to do it with the general term uh, of the Taylor series. So that's why they usually ask you to find that first. But just keep in mind to do the ratio test for the radius convergence, which will ultimately find interval convergence, you need the general term. You can't just do it on ends with derivatives. You need x's. So now let's do this question that's very classic. Uh, you're given a derivative formula and you're writing the Taylor series. So what I like to do is on the side, I like to just plug in these numbers. So what this is saying is um, you plug in a number, for example, like the 18th derivative. You would just plug in 18 in every single n and you would just solve that. And again, it's, it's a number in the end because it's a derivative 
at x is equal to 1, x being the center, x equal 1 being the center point. So for example, um, usually they give you f of 1, but in this case we can just plug in 0. So notice that all I'm doing is I'm plugging in 0 and I'm finding a number. Then I plug in 1, I'm plug, uh, finding a number, plug it in 2. I'm never plugging in x is equal to 1, I'm plugging in the derivative number, be careful. You're plugging in n values, not x values. So in this case, uh, at the very end, you plug in 3. So 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, and you'll get this. So again, I tell my students, list out the derivatives. Sometimes they list them out for you, which is always nice. But even if they don't, if they list out a derivative formula, list out the derivatives uh, so you can find them. And then when you write out the uh, Taylor series, it'll be uh, much easier because you'll just replace that number where, where it goes. So for example, I always write two things. I list out the derivatives, then I, I list out my general Taylor series formula just to tell them I know what to do. I know what the Taylor series formula is. You don't have to bug me. So the Taylor series formula is this, f at x equals 1, no matter what the derivatives are, f of 1 plus blah, 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 f prime of 1 over 1 factorial, x minus 1. Uh, again, three things matching, third uh, derivative over 3 factorial cubed. Just remember the factorials, of course. And then so if you write out this formula right here, and then you write out the derivatives in your own handwriting, it is just so much easier to find the Taylor series what you want. So for example, where, what is f of 1? Well, I just wrote it. It's negative 1 half. What is um, f prime of 1? f prime of 1 is 2 thirds. What's 2 thirds divided by 1 factorial? That's 2 thirds. Uh, same thing here. We have negative 1. Uh, we have f double prime of 1. That's negative 1 divided by 2 factorial, which is 2. So you have negative 1 half x minus 1 squared. So again, you're just being very careful. You're just writing out everything and then you're just replacing things, uh, these derivatives for every term, including the general term. Um, and it's just so much easier if they're just just right there in front of you. You just take this number and replace, take this number and replace. Uh, that's why it's nice to list out the, der der uh, der the derivatives. I never know how to pronounce the word uh, derivative and I'm a calculus teacher. So when you have this uh, third derivative, for example, you're replacing it with eight fifths. Uh, and if you want, you don't even need to simplify. If it says write the first four non-zero, so I didn't simplify this. Uh, just be careful. This would be eight over 30, for example. And you don't flip these uh, six. Some people think that, but it's just fractions. But you don't even need to simplify. Sometimes it's nice to simplify. Uh, for example, if you're doing interval convergence on that general term, uh, it's nice to simplify before you take the ratio test. But you actually don't need to simplify. And then for the general term, it's the same exact thing. You take the the correct derivative, which was given actually, you just divide it by the correct factorial number, which will be n factorial, and it'll be x minus 1 to the n. So again, these Taylor series questions aren't too bad. List out the derivatives first, use the formula, and then plug in the derivative numbers, the derivatives at 1, so the second derivative at 1, the third uh, derivative at 1, the fourth derivative at 1, and so on. But you already have those listed out, so that will be pretty easy, and you just replace where they go. It's in the coefficient and the numerator above the factorial. So that's the Taylor series formula. That's the process I do. List out derivatives, list out the general formula, start replacing, including the general uh, term. So that's how I like to do those questions. Again, if you want to practice, you can either check our, our videos introducing Taylor series, where we practice a lot of these, as well as multiple choice level questions. And then uh, those difficulty one, four, and seven videos are for uh, these type of questions. Then uh, we're going to this side, I think. Uh, so, uh, before I highlighted sort of how to do that sort of stuff, I uh, remember I mentioned there's two main Taylor series questions. So this was the Taylor series question where you're starting off with a derivative formula. There's no Taylor series on the page. So you construct a Taylor series using the formula because it, re it requires derivatives. So you're able to uh, uh, make it. But there's some Taylor series where you are already know a Taylor series either by memorizing it or by it's given. So you don't want to find the Taylor series of functions like e to the three, negative 3x three or 3x squared times sine of x by using that derivative formula. Just keep in mind how nasty it would be to find the seventh derivative of this using product rule. It would just be impossible, basically. So this is the second strategy of Taylor series. Going from one Taylor series to the next by manipulating algebraically or taking a derivative or taking an integral. So for example, uh, these are the Taylor series, actually the McLaurin series of special functions that appear. Uh, you'll see these in difficulty six, uh, three and nine as we go through these series. But you just need to memorize these basically. I tell my students to memorize them. I make them a quiz where they, uh, it's an easy quiz. You just memorize them. But just keep in mind what's happening. 
things you want to be careful of is whether it's alternating. So notice sine and cosine are alternating, uh, but not e to the x, for example. Then you want to know, it, does it have all the exponents or do I have, am I missing some exponents? So e to the x and ln of 1 plus x, for example, include all the exponents. But sine of x, it only includes the odd ones. Cosine of x is only includes the even ones. That's why cosine is an even function and sine is an odd function. Then you want to include the factorials. Do this, does this Taylor series have factorials? So e to the x, sine of x, cosine do, but not ln 1 plus x and arc 10. So again, what we're going to do or what we're going to talk about is uh, how to go from one Taylor series to the next without uh, doing the formula, without with skipping this step. So once you have one Taylor series, you don't want to create a second Taylor series from scratch. You use that first Taylor series. So the most common example here is, for example, e to the minus 3x. So what we're going to try to uh, determine the differences, what's the difference between plugging in minus 3x versus multiplying by, for example, 3x squared? So the main difference is when you're plugging in minus 3x, you're literally replacing all the x's with that expression. So notice uh, this first term wasn't changed because there were no x's, but you replace this minus 3x with this x, you take this x squared, you replace it with minus 3x, you take this x cubed, you replace it with minus 3x. So notice when you're replacing all these things, the minus 3 is getting raised to whatever exponent you have. So for example, minus 3 squared, that's 9. Uh, minus 3 to the 7th, uh, seventh, that will be, sorry, 3rd, I can't read my own handwriting, uh, that's 27. So this is plug again an expression. Um, you're just replacing all the x's with minus uh, whatever your expression is, all the x's. Look at the difference between 3x squared. When you're multiplying by something as opposed to plugging in something, so this is multiply, if we can tell, you're distributing this 3x squared into all these terms. So, for example, uh, you're just going to take this and you're going to FOIL. 3x squared times this, 3x squared times this, 3x squared times this. You're going to be using this rule a lot that we alluded to when we were doing interval convergence. a to the b times a to the c is a to the b plus c. So notice when we have 3x squared times x, that's going to be 2 plus 1. So it's going to be 3x cubed. The next one is going to be 3x squared times x cubed. That's not 3x to the 6. You add the exponents. So it's going to be 3x to the 5th, uh, 3x to the 7th, 2 plus 5, uh, 2 plus 7. Basically, you're bumping up all these by 2 because you're adding 2 to every exponent. But look at the 3, though. The 3 is getting multiplied all the time, but it's not getting raised to any exponents. Because, for example, in this case, the negative 3 was part of the expression that you plugged in. So the negative 3 was being raised to the powers as well. But this 3x is on the x, uh, this 3 right here is on the outside of everything. So this 3 is just getting multiplied every time. It's not getting raised to an exponent. So just be wary of that. That's the difference between plugging in and multiplying. And for example, if you had to do both, you definitely want to plug in. So we didn't write this one out. Uh, we have so many of these in our special function uh, Taylor series video if you want to check those out. But for example, if you have uh, x squared times cosine x cubed, you would start off with cosine x. You would plug in x cubed, which would change uh, not this first term, but all the other terms. You replace x cubed, x with x cubed. And then if you wanted to find x squared cosine x cubed, you would finally distribute by x squared. So that's the sort of the operations. Plug in, then multiply. Really, you're just doing what's the inside function, and then what do I do for the outside? Um, you'll see that it's combined a lot of times. You don't just plug in or multiply. You might be doing other stuff. So we're going to talk about a few more things. Um, in terms of special functions. So sometimes they want you to find the Taylor series of something that's rational. Um, so what you do is you actually reverse do a over one minus r because this is geometric. And they'll say something like find the Taylor series on the radius convergence so you know that this formula applies. So uh, you're reverse doing a over one minus r. r remembers the ratio, a is the first term. So that will allow you to find the Taylor series. Just keep in mind that the a is very easy. It's the thing on the top if there's a 1 on the bottom. So a is on the top. And then just keep in mind that the formula is usually 1 minus r. So if it's 1 plus, like in this case, that means that the r will be negative. So in this case, r is negative 5x squared. And once you have this information, it is very, very, very easy to come up with the Taylor series. All you do is you stick with the first term. Again, a is the first term, the thing on the top. And then you keep multiplying by the ratio because that's what a geometric series is. You take negative 5x squared and you multiply uh, this one by that, and then you multiply it again by minus 5x squared. Um, here, again, you're using this exponent law because you're distributing. 
So in this case, the minus five would be squared. You could um, use strategies that we talked about before. You could start off with a Taylor series of one over one minus x, which is a geometric series, one plus x plus x squared plus x cubed, no alternating, no factorials. And then you could plug in negative five x squared, and then finally you can multiply by four x. But I think this uh, geometric series way is just a lot easier. You don't have to be careful with plugging in or something. You just find a and just keep multiplying by the r. Just keep in mind that the r is negative in this case because it's a over one minus r. So uh, one last thing about these special functions, sometimes they ask limits. So uh, when they do limits, the spirit of the question wouldn't be to L'Hopital's or apply L'Hopital's rule. It's just to do the limit using Taylor series. Uh, sometimes they'll have their general f of x formulas where you do the same process. So keep in mind that this is the same idea. You'll go, you're going from one Taylor series to the next. So we're going to first find the Taylor series of ln of 1 plus x squared. Just keep in mind that the formula that's usually remembered is ln of 1 plus x. So notice we're plugging in x squared, sort of like how we plugged in negative 3x. We're definitely not plugging in, for example, 1 plus x squared. So again, you just replace all these x's with x squared. So that's why, if you can tell my handwriting, uh, it's going to be x squared squared. So that's x to the fourth, x squared cubed, that's x to the sixth, and so on. So again, just replace whatever function you have with its Taylor series. What's going to happen is that a lot of things will cancel. So for example, you're going to have x squared and x squared. So x squared from the Taylor series and this random minus x squared. Of course, when we're subtracting from something with parentheses, you don't subtract it from every single term. It's not, there's no like distribution of subtraction. It's only distribution of multiplication. So when you subtract off this negative x squared, you only subtract it off once. But that's great, of course, because it'll get rid of the x squared and the Taylor series. So that's going to go down. And then when you divide by x to the fourth, of course, this one, you, because division is the opposite of multiplication, you are distributing into every single one of these terms. So notice, basically, all the exponents go down by four. That's how you do exponents. So in this case, you're going to be left with negative one half plus whatever terms. And what's great about these limits is that when you plug in the number, after you've done all your simplification, a lot of the numbers will go away because you're plugging in zero. So every other term in this Taylor series, I didn't write anymore, but all of them would have X's. So you're just left with negative one half. So when you do these limit questions, they're the same as these special function questions. You find the Taylor series, you might add or subtract some terms because uh, you want to get rid of the leading, uh, like the, the constant term or the X term or whatever. And then when you divide by x, usually there's only one thing remaining, and then everything else has x's. So when you plug in that middle number, all the x's will go away, and you're just left with that limit. So that's how you do limits. Again, what I'm trying to stress is that if you have one Taylor series and you want to go to another Taylor series, just use a formula and just know how to plug in versus multiply. Uh, maybe do geometric, something like that. Same thing with derivatives and integrals of Taylor series. So when you're starting off with a Taylor series and just trying to find its derivative, you do not want to use the derivative formula for Taylor series because that would be quite awful. All you're doing is you're taking term by term Taylor series uh, derivatives. And also derivatives and integrals of Taylor series is actually very easy. It's a lot easier than, for example, um, I don't even know, chain rule or um, integration by parts or integration by partial fractions. Because what you're doing in every single case is you're actually just doing the power rule because it's so polynomials, even if it goes on forever, you're just taking term by term and you're just adding one and uh, multiplying by the reciprocal if you're taking integrals, or you're just dropping the exponent and subtracting one if you're doing derivatives. So for example, if we have this Taylor series right here, this is f of x, what's this derivative? Well, it's this is going to go away, obviously. So you're left with negative one half because that's the der derivative of negative one half x. Then you drop this power like it's hot to the front, two over four, that cancels one half. I'm just doing the power rule. Subtracting one, it's at x. Drop this guy to the front. Four times two is eight. Subtract one, and then drop this two to the front. Five over 10 is one half x to the fourth. So again, derivatives are actually very easy. You just do it term by term, just do it slowly, and it's always the power rule for both derivatives and integrals. Um, so then, even if you have it in the general term, some people get confused of how do I take the derivative of the general term? It looks so complicated. It's still the power rule. Just keep in mind what's a constant. So you're taking the derivative with respect to x. So all of this guy right here is a constant, and this is the actual x term. So you again, you do the same thing. You take this exponent, drop it to the front. Here, it's uh, we talked about these factorial rules, but n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial is n factorial. You'll subtract 1, so n plus 1 minus 1 is n. 
And this is just the general term for F prime. Again, all you're doing is the power rule. While this might look complicated, it's just a constant. So you can write it as this times x to the n plus one, if that makes you feel any better. So uh, same thing with integrals. Integrals are slightly harder, but because they're integrals, but uh, in this case, you're still using the power rule. So for example, we're finding the Taylor series of g to the x. I wrote this really small, I'm sorry, uh, but I think it'll be fine. I'm very careful when I do these integrals. I'm very precise with my variables and things like that. So I'll, I'll let you know how that works. So here we have these derivative formulas, uh, sort of like in the first one, uh, where we have derivative formulas. So let's think about this. We're trying to find the Taylor polynomial, the second, uh, third degree Taylor polynomial, basically go up to the x cubed term. That actually won't include this term. Uh, sorry, didn't see that. But we're finding the third degree Taylor polynomial of g of x. Well, we need to first find the Taylor series of f of x. In this case, we are going to do the derivative formula because we don't have any Taylor series for f of x. We only have derivatives of f. If we had something like e to the x and we had its Taylor series already and we wanted to take its integral, we would probably just not use the formula at all. But in this case, we do have derivatives, so we're going to use the formula. So this is my Taylor series for f of x. I'm doing the same thing. Uh, for example, this term right here is f double prime. So it's negative 1 over 2 factorial, which is 2, uh, to the square term. So I simplified everything because I wanted to practice just the integral. But this is the Taylor series from this formula. The same way we did actually this question right here, uh, except in this new question, the derivative is already listed for me. So I don't even need to apply a, a, a derivative formula. All I do is I have the Taylor series and plug in the numbers where they go uh, in the numerator of the coefficients. So in this case, this is how I formed it. So for example, this is the most complex term, but it's the third derivative at two, negative two thirds, uh, divided by six, because that's three factorial. Negative two thirds over six um, is negative one ninth, because the twos will cancel, and then you'll be left with three times three, and then you're gonna raise it to the third. So this is one of the reasons why you would wanna simplify a Taylor series, because you're about to take an integral, and usually uh, a general rule in calculus is if you want to take a derivative or an integral, it's nice to simplify to make the, that, those processes easier. So now, again, this is the Taylor series of f of x that was found using the derivative formulas. So if you want to go for this Taylor polynomial of g of x, notice that it says f of t. So I did one little small step. I just replaced all these x's with t's because why not? It's, uh, that's the variable of integration. So then again, when you're applying the integral, it's just the power rule. So what's the integral of 1? Well, because I'm integrating with respect to t, it's technically t. The integral of 2 is 2t. Then I'm doing the power rule. I'm adding 1, so it becomes 2, and then I'm flipping the new exponent. So that's why it's 1 half times 1 half. It's 1 to the fourth, 1 fourth. Same thing here. You add 1 to the exponent, so it's 3. Then you do 1 third uh, times 1 half, so that's 1 six. And then finally, uh, when you do t minus 2 to the third, you add 1, so it's 4 flip the new exponent or multiply by the reciprocal of the new exponent is another way to say it. So it's 1 over 36. And then uh, I do have numbers on top and bottom. I have limits. So I do the normal fundamental theorem of calculus. I plug in x and I plug in 2. Plugging in x is very nice. All it does is replace all the t's with x's. Plugging in 2 is even nicer because all of these terms go away. So keep in mind, it'll be this thing with x's minus 2, basically, when you plug in 2 because of this guy right here. But I like it of the form x minus 2 times x plus x minus 2 to the 1 plus blah, 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 x minus 2 squared and so on. So I combine that x minus 2 to the front, but you really don't have to do that. And then keep in mind, we are doing third degree Taylor polynomial. Again, that means go up to the third term. It's not three non-zero terms, which it is in this case by coincidence. It's go up to the third term. So that's why I got rid of this fourth term. But that's how you do derivatives and integrals. Again, for this entire sheet of paper, you're trying to go from one Taylor series to the next. So you start off with the Taylor series, and then just go to that other Taylor series, either by plugging and multiplying, if necessary, deriving or integrating. The time you do the Taylor series formula is when you given derivatives. And this was not the case, except in this question, because we were given uh, derivatives. So that is going to take up the bulk of this video. Those are our three main skills, um, radius and interval of convergence. Taylor series formula and derivatives, and then going from one Taylor series to the next, either by uh, from a special function or from a previous just Taylor series that you found. So that will 
be probably six to seven to eight points on every single question on Taylor series. And then there's small little things, these last three things. Uh, the error bound is actually pretty big. So let's talk about that and we will be good to go. So this is going to be, um, so I made a page for that as well. So again, sometimes they ask these geometric uh, series questions. Uh, the way they asked it is writing f of x as a rational function. So in this case, we're going to be going backwards to what we did earlier. Uh, in this case, we have we have a form of something a over 1 minus r, and we construct the Taylor's uh, uh, series from that because this is the first term, and we keep multiplying by r. In this case, what we're doing is we're starting off with the Taylor series, recognizing what is a over 1 minus r, and then applying a over 1 minus r, and that's going to be the rational function. So remember, it's really easy. A is the easiest thing. It's just the first term. It's just looking at you right now. Uh, you don't have to do anything. So that's one. And then what's the R? It's the thing getting multiplied every time. So in this case, it's negative 2x squared plus 4x to the fourth and so on. So this is going to be the R. It's the ratio, the thing getting multiplied every time. Then you apply this formula. Again, uh, it is plus here because it's 1 minus minus this minus right here. So that's how you do geometric. A over 1 minus R. No matter if it's numbers in the multiple choice section, once you recognize something is geometric, meaning the terms are changing because you're multiplying by a certain ratio every time, you just apply A over 1 minus R probably. Uh, like, for example, when you find the sum of a series of like, I don't know, one third N, then you find the A, you find the R, you do A over 1 minus R. Same thing, even if it has axis. So uh, another question that they like to ask is um, sort of not like to ask, but maybe like every five years or so is a relative min or max question. So this is what we talked about earlier, but the main way to do relative min or max on the AP exam is, of course, the first derivative test. So f has a relative max when f prime goes from positive to negative. f uh, has a relative min when f prime goes from negative to positive. How you're doing that is you're drawing a sign chart of f prime, probably, or you're graphing f prime using a calculator, or an f prime graph is provided already. And you're seeing where f prime crosses the axis, basically. But sometimes uh, they force you to do the second derivative test. And that's often the case when uh, you, you're not a, you can't draw the sign chart because it goes on forever, for example. Or in differential equation for response questions, when the first derivative is in terms of x's and y's, you just can't draw the sign chart. So you have to do something, and that's when you're forced to do the second derivative test. But the second derivative test is not too bad. First off, you need to find the second derivative at that number. Um, so in this case, uh, this is sort of that reverse engineering. We need to find f double prime of 0. But where does f double prime of zero live on every single Taylor series? It's part of the coefficient of the x uh, x terms. So for example, in this case, it's, or not in this case, every case, it always lives in here. But keep in mind, it's not just negative one six. The derivative number at the uh, center point over to the factorial, that's what the coefficient is. So I'm like, oh, I need to find the second derivative. I'm definitely not gonna look at this term. I'm gonna be looking at the x squared term. And then when I have the second derivative, I know that when I divide it by 2 factorial, that's what the coefficient of the Taylor series term will be for the x squared term. So then I can easily isolate uh, f double prime by just multiplying. So I get negative 1 third here. And then let's apply the second derivative test. So remember the second der derivative test is sort of opposite what you might expect. It says the first derivative is 0. And in this case, the first derivative is 0 because there's no linear term. And it says if the second derivative is negative, it's actually a relative max. This is all based on concavity. So the first derivative uh, being zero means there's a horizontal tangent line. The second derivative being negative means it's concave down. So if it's concave down, it means there's a realm max. And that's how to do it. So again, uh, this is sort of the ways they make you force you to do the second derivative test. Sometimes it's in multiple choice questions that are theoretical. Sometimes it's in the differential equation for response questions. And sometimes it's in the Taylor series questions. Not too bad. We have one last thing to talk about, error bound. So error bound is pretty tricky because um, people don't really understand it because it's a very theoretical concept, but it's actually not too bad. So uh, remember that this is the form of an uh, Taylor's uh, error bound of an alternating series. So basically what happens is you're trying to find an infinite sum, but that's impossible and you would really like to, but you take the next best option, which is you're just going to approximate um, the infinite sum by just finding a partial sum. So instead of finding the, uh, adding up an infinite number of terms, you just add up the first three terms, for example. And what it says is that if you have an alternating series, 
just plugging into the three first three terms is actually a pretty good approximation. And how good is the approximation? It's bounded by the uh, the absolute value of the next term over. So again, uh, let's say I can't add up the first infinite terms because it's infinite. It would take me a long time. What I can do is just plug it into the first three terms. How good is that approximation to the actual term, the, the thing I'll never be able to find? Impossible thing, possible thing? Well, it's actually pretty good. It's just the next term over. It would be the fourth term. Keep in mind, this only applies for alternating series. So the terms have to be, uh, for example, going to zero and decreasing. The positive terms absolutely take the absolute value, the things that are not alternating. So let's try to do it in this case. So uh, what it says is you use the second degree Taylor polynomial uh, to show that it is within 0 0.1. So some questions actually ask you to find the approximation. That's like usually in part B or something. So if you have this series right here, how would you approximate f of 1? What you would do is you would just plug in 1 again into not just the second term, but every term before it. That would be the approximation. That would be um, the question before this one right here. Then they would ask you the error bound question and the next question. So uh, we're actually not finding the approximation in this case. That would be this. Again, it would be plugging in 1 into these three terms right here up to the second term. Instead, we want to find how good is this approximation to the function value. We're not going to be able to fun find the function value because we can't plug in 1 into this infinite number of terms. So what it is, it's always the next one over. So if you, we, we approximated with these three terms. So the next one over is this guy right here. Be careful, you don't include any negative because you're always looking at the things that are alternating, not the terms themselves. So like, I'm looking at 1 half, 1 fourth x, 1 16th x squared, and then 1 over 96 x cubed. I don't look at the alternating part. So what you do is you just plug in uh, this number you want. Of course, this is 1, so this is great. When you plug in 1, you'll get 1 over 96. That is smaller than 0 0.1. That's 1 tenth. And you're actually done. And that's how you do error bound. Again, there's three things. The thing you'll never be able to find, the actual approximation of the thing you'll never be able to find, usually in the question before. And then uh, what it asks you is, how good is this approximation? It's always the next term over, the absolute value of the next term over, uh, which is uh, plugging in the x value. So in this case, we're plugging in uh, 1, and we get 1 over 96, which is less than 0 0.1. So that's how it works. Again, not too bad. Really, all you're doing is you're just finding the next term over and plugging in a number. It is pretty theoretical, but uh, it's not too bad in my opinion. Then we have Lagrange error bound, which is really similar. Um, so we didn't write what this is, but the max is uh, going to be the max of the fifth derivative for all x's, or for x's in some interval. So Lagrange error bound works the same way. Again, this would be the thing you'll never be able to find because you're plugging in one half into like an infinite number of things, whatever. And then we can find this one, P4 one half. That would just be plugging in the first three terms. And what the Lagrange error bound says is that it's bounded by the next term over in the Taylor series. Um, so for example, it, it would be something like this. X to the fifth over five factorial M, where M is the max of the fifth derivative. So this is Lagrange error bound. What it says is that this approximation using the uh, nth degree Taylor polynomial, meaning plug it into the nth degree and every single term before that and add it all up, I can actually find that because that's finite. How good is that approximation? Well, it's the next term over. Well, not the next term over, but this term over that deals with the next term over, um, which is just find how big the fifth derivative can be, how big that next der derivative can be uh, in whatever interval you have divide it by the same factorial number, and then raise it to the fifth. And so, for example, in this case, the max will be this. And they have to tell you something about the max. So, for example, they just told me that uh, this max is going to be 60. Uh, keep in mind that sometimes they provide a graph where you look at the graph and you're like, oh, this has to be less than 40 or something. So, in this case, we replace the n with 60 because that's the biggest the fifth derivative can be. We divide it by 5 factorial. That's actually very nice because if you don't know, 5 factorial is 120. 60 over 120 is 1 half. 1 half to the 6. 2, 4, 8, 6. Sorry, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. That's 1 over 64, so that's why it's less than 1 over 60. So both error bound questions are really similar. Sometimes they ask you to find the approximation. That's great. You just do it. Um, not too bad. You might have to add fractions or something like that. And then 
the error bound itself, the approximation is not part of the question. It's always the error bound, the next question in these, for example. Uh, you're always looking at the next term over, just the positive thing, and, and uh, you just plug in the number. For the Grange error bound, the max is the biggest that next derivative can be on your interval. So they're just sort of the miscellaneous topics. So we actually got through this video uh, shortly over an hour. Uh, hopefully you don't mind that I didn't write anything really. If I did, this video would have probably been two hours, which I don't mind because I like hanging out with you guys, but I'm not sure how much fun you have uh, while doing Taylor series. So just keep in mind that Taylor series, again, is very difficult. What I would suggest is you will continue watching our video series. That's why we made them, so we can help you guys out. Um, you'll just practice Taylor series and you'll get more and more comfortable with them. You'll get more and more comfortable with radius and interval convergence by setting up the ratio tests, plugging in numbers, doing series tests, things like that, canceling out stuff, um, canceling out factorials, limits, and things like that. You'll be more comfortable using the Taylor series formula, uh, using derivatives to come up with the Taylor series formula by writing out and listing derivatives, writing out the polynomial, and then replacing the derivatives where you go. You'll also be better at going from one Taylor series to the next. The first step is, of course, memorizing but you'll know the difference between plugging in and multiplying, maybe finding limits, Taylor series or geometric series, and also taking derivatives term by term with a power rule or integrals term by term with a power rule. Then you'll also cover the miscellaneous stuff, geometric series pop-ups up, relative min and max pops up, but most questions do have error bound questions that are like two to three points. And really what you're always looking at is the next term over. Plug in the x value into the next term over. So hopefully this video series, uh, video has been helpful. Again, if you want more examples, we have so many Taylor series videos on our channel uh, that you can enjoy and watch uh, in order for you to improve. Uh, thanks again for watching and I hope to see you in one of those Taylor series uh, difficulty videos. Until then, uh, thanks again for watching and uh, supporting our channel.